Thanks. Hi. Just check whether okay to stand on this side, is it? Video guys, yeah. Okay. Um just a quick check. How many were here the last time we were here in November? Okay, wow. So it's mostly brand new. Okay, excellent, excellent, okay. Um what I'm gonna talk about tonight is centered around the concept of what a no vote would look like, okay? Um, and I'm going to take it from a, a different perspective from from Michelle and from Alan, who's coming coming later. Um, I'm basically going to give you the uh, the financials behind it, the numbers behind it. Um, so th there's a fair bit of numbers in this, um, and uh, I mean that's the way it is. We're, we're going to go through that, explain to you what's what, and let you see that there's um, there's, uh, there's some substance behind it. Um, and obviously in the Q&A later, there'll be plenty of opportunity for people that want to go into anything in uh, a bit more detail, okay? So what I'm going to run through fairly quickly, first of all, um, a bit about Scotland's finances. Is it a rich country? Um, okay. Um, second, a bit about how Scotland gets its money at the moment. A wee bit about what's actually been committed from the no count, which is already in legislation, um, and the fact that they haven't actually committed any more than that at the moment. And then I'll be comment on uh, what happened last time. Um, okay. In terms of Scotland, the finances, um, this is a kind of light version of what I did the last time I was here, which was 35 minutes of numbers, and it's all on YouTube for anybody that's got the, the inclination to go and watch it. It's actually not as bad as it sounds, um, and you can take your time and go through it. But just to summarise it at a very top level, um, Scots generate last year £10,700 in taxes, that's everything, corporation tax, council tax, income tax, national insurance, VAT, including all the oil money, um, compared to a UK average of 9,000. So we generate £1,700 more in tax. Interestingly, we also spend £1,200 more per head, and there's a lot of reasons for that historically, but I'm going to come back to that number later on. Um, Scotland's national income, gross domestic product, as it's called, 18% higher than the UK average. So in relative terms to the UK, Scotland is, is richer than the UK. Um, we're on a deficit, means we do spend more than we um, we earn. Every country in the Western world at the moment, with the exception of Norway, spends more than it earns um, because of the, the financial crash, etc. Scotland's deficit to GDP, which is how they measure it, is about 5%. The UK is nearly 8%, and the average of industrialised countries is 6.5%. So Scotland's actually, while it's um, running at a deficit, it's in much better financial health than, uh, than most Western countries. Um, Independent Scotland, we're the eighth richest country in the world. Um, UK is currently at number 16. And that's the um, the chart, which is uh, GDP in dollars, um, 2011. Okay, So Scotland, $42,000, and uh, the UK, 35. Interesting, if you look at the top 10, um, Luxembourg, Norway, Switzerland, Netherlands, Ireland, Austria, Sweden, it's mostly small, independent, North European countries most of whom um, have actually a lot less natural resources than we have. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's kind of the starting point. Um, and one last point on this. Um, Scotland's got 8.4% of the UK population. We generate nearly 10% of UK revenue, and we incur just over 9% of UK spending. So um, we spend more per head, but we generate in, in revenue a lot more than that. In actual fact, if we got as much money back um, is that 9.9% uh, of spending the same as we generate in revenue, we'd have an extra four and a half billion, okay, and the independence dividend. Okay, okay um, and that was last year, but if you look back over history over the last 30 years, it's the same story. The dark line there is Scotland's um, tax take per head, and the light line is, um, the smaller line is the UK's tax take per head. So every year back to the 1980, We've uh, generated more tax in the UK. Back in the early 80s, it was an awful lot more um, in the, the, when the oil first started. And that's really what kept the whole um, Thatcher bandwagon on the road back in those days um, at a UK level. Um, and it's up and it's down. Some years it's a bit more, other years it's an awful lot more. Okay. So I see everything's on a YouTube video. If you want more background on the numbers, it, it's half an hour long. It's, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's up to 5,000 views at the moment. So. If you've not seen it, go watch it and pass it on. Um, I think if you just put my name in, it comes up, because that's the only thing I've done. So, um, OK, um, how is Scotland funded? At the moment, the way it works, if you don't know, everything that's collected in Scotland gets sent south. 
Aye, um, it's all done electronically these days. They don't have trains going up and down like in, in the old days in the great train robbery. But anyway, everything goes south um, and then it all gets sent back up. There's only about 7% that's actually collected in Scotland of Scotland's revenue, which is mainly council tax and things like that, that uh, goes to local authorities of the Scottish government. Um, the vast majority of it is, is collected centrally in, uh, in London. The UK government then decides how much of that to send back up here. And the way they do that is what's um, called the Barnett formula, which was named after a guy called Barnett who was um, in politics in the 60s and 70s. And he devised this formula. Um, the point of the Barnett formula, two things. First of all, it isn't enshrined in law, so it's just a convention. Westminster could change it any time it wanted to. And the UK parties have basically said they're all going to look at it. Um, and there's been all kinds of people saying that we sh they should get rid of it. Okay. Um, and the way it's calculated, without going into too much detail, but effectively any extra revenue you get um, is on a pound for pound basis. So the fact that Scotland's had higher spending per head in the past, over time as more and more spending carries on and, and budgets increase each year through inflation or whatever, the extra money is on a pound for pound basis. So the differential gets squeezed. So I went back through the, 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 the reports for the last uh, 15 years and dug the numbers out. So what this shows you is the percentage that Scotland gets spending more per head compared to the UK and how that's moved over the last, uh, well, since 97 through to last year, okay? So back then we were getting 18% more and it's been up and down and gradually down, 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 down to where we're getting just about 10% more. And that's a function of the way that formula works, okay? Um, so obviously if that continues over the next period of time, it'll continue getting squeezed more and more, okay? Um, so take a wee step back, so where does the money come from in Scotland, where does it go to? Um, income tax, national insurance is the biggest part, VAT, council taxes, domestic, non-domestic rates, corporation tax, fuel road tax, um, fags, booze and whatever, uh, North Sea money and then a whole bunch of other smaller things. And that's the total, and you can see in percentages there where it all comes from. So the biggest part, income tax, national insurance and then VAT and the, the oil money was about 10%. Um, sorry, 18%, yeah. Um, and that's in a wee pretty picture for people that prefer pictures to list the numbers. Okay. So that's where the money um, the money comes from, um, and that's where the money goes to. Okay, so that's Scotland spent. Um, biggest part, pensions and welfare, then health, education, and then the police, etc., transport, um, housing and community stuff, so that a lot of local government stuff. Recreation, which I think will include the BBC and our share of that, et cetera, et cetera, and then a whole bunch of other things. And those are the things that are spent in Scotland. On top of that, there's a bunch of stuff that is um, what they call allocated. So it's spent by London, but they basically charge us for it in the accounts. And that includes our share of uh, London's um, interest payment. So just to be clear, the UK has got a debt of £1.4 trillion, which is about £22,000 per head. Um, this is all in, in the YouTube video, if you see it. Um, and every year they have to pay about £50 billion, £50 billion in interest payments on that. Um, and our share of that is about £4 billion. And that's gone up every year, obviously, because they're borrowing more. And their interest rates are going up every year as well. Um, so that's a big, big, scary number, and it's getting bigger. Um, we spend uh, just £3.3 billion on our share of the UK defence budget including Trident, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. And then a whole bunch of other things, including their share of embassy costs overseas, et cetera, which are all added in there. Um, and some account accountancy stuff to square the numbers up. But that's basically where the money goes for uh, for background. Okay, and there's a, another wee graph. Okay, okay so um, very quick point on defence. So Scotland gets charged 3.3 billion, which is our share of the UK's 40 billion spend um, on defence. The actual defence money spent in Scotland is about 1.9 billion. That number is based on our population share. So just take 8.4% of the big number and put that in the books for us. Thanks very much. Um, an independent Scottish defence force in the white paper is about 2.5 billion, which is the same as, for example, Denmark. Similar population, similar geography, similar defence requirements. So that you can do a pretty useful. Um, armed Forces, Navy, Air Force, a whole lot for that kind of money. So straight away you've got a significant saving there. And the other one's on debt interest payments, this 4.1 billion I talked about. Um, and if you remember back, those of you that are still with me, um, Scotland's um, 
deficit to GDP is only 5%, the UK is nearly 8%, but it still charges the same um, per head charge for uh, interest payments, even though our, 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 our deficit is much lower. So, um, so there's a couple of things that are added into the cost. Um, I just want to touch very briefly on this. This is um, how much different countries pay on interest rates for the debt that they borrow. Because there's been this um, whole story going around um, about how the UK was, was great and people would lend it money cheap. In actual fact, we are here the last time, there was a couple of guys were, were, were talking about that. So I went did some, some digging on the numbers. This is what 10-year uh, government bonds. So if you borrow money or lend money to the UK government, they'll pay you that interest rate on a 10-year bond. Um, interestingly, Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Austria, um, and, and Europe, Sweden, France, even France, Belgium, um, are all getting uh, better deals from the money market on that. So um, the kind of scare story that Scotland would have to pay more for its debt is exactly that. It's a whole whole bunch of nonsense. Okay. Um, okay, so people talk about extra powers and what's coming down the road. Calman is the, uh, the Scotland Act 2012, which is the stuff that's already been passed um, in Westminster have agreed to bring those extra powers in. So I went and had a look at what was actually there because they talk about it as if it's a big deal. The two things that they're actually bringing in are stamp duty on land, right, and landfill tax, which is a total of about three or 400 million out of 57 billion. So it's less than 1% of the total um, revenue generation. So when they talk about extra powers, it's, 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 it's next to nothing. What they're also doing is putting in place a Scottish income tax, um, but I mean, those powers are there already at the moment. You can vary tax by 3%, but nobody's ever used it, and they're going to increase it to 10%. But what you can't do, you're not allowed to change the um, where the different bands kick in. You're not allowed to change the higher rates. You're not allowed to change national insurance. All you can do is kind of play about with, uh, with the, the basic rate up or down a few points. So in terms of giving you the scope that you'd want to be able to redesign the whole tax system, it obviously it doesn't do anything like that, so it's fairly fairly useless in that sense. Um, so that's what the big uh, the big trumpeting's been about, about the extra powers we're all going to get, not guaranteed. The important point to note is that the, uh, all the parties have kind of made noises, certain individuals have made noises about there might be more coming down the road if you're all good Scots and vote no in the referendum, we'll talk to you afterwards. But frankly, you've got to be um, smoking something to buy that. Okay, um, so even under the Calman proposals, uh, Ian, and even if you decided to, to make the 10% variation in tax, you, the amount of control you've actually got in the Scottish Parliament is pretty minimal. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out, I mentioned that, that Barnet was a kind of convention. You've also got to remember that the fact that there is a Scottish Parliament is something that Westminster could decide to abolish as well. There's, there's no British constitution as such. There's absolutely nothing to stop a Westminster Parliament deciding, do you know what, we're going to abolish the Scottish Parliament. Um, the only protection against that, obviously, is independence, which allows you sovereignty to uh, have your own parliament by right. Okay. So we talked about Barnet, um, and if you listen to the guys from, from the Wales, uh, the, the Labour First Minister in Wales, and other people in the Tory party, etc., etc., who have made a lot of noises about we need to get rid of Barnet, because the perception, obviously, down south is that Scotland gets more spending per head. Um, they're not interested in the fact that we generate a lot more tax. All they see is extra spend. Um, so um, if we were to lose that, then um, and they, they took us down to the 8.4%, the same population share, then it would mean a cut in the budget of 6.2 billion. Okay, there's a number. So our population, 5.3 million, UK 63 and a quarter, 8.4%. There's the, the different revenue numbers. Um, so Scotland running at a deficit, the UK running at a much, much bigger deficit. Their deficit is 120 billion compared to our 7 billion, um, and uh, that number, we come down to that number, 6.2 billion. So I showed you what the money gets spent on, um, so let's have a wee look back at that and see how that kind of works, right? Because you've got to remember the defence spending and the debt interest payments and all the overseas stuff we pay for, um, that doesn't get touched because that's all, we don't spend it anyway, that's just charged back to us in the books. You need to take the money out of the actual stuff you spend in Scotland, which is that stuff there. So um, that's a big number. I, I don't know. I don't know where you start to take the knife to that little lot. Okay. It's a bit scary. You could take out all the ones at the bottom. <laughs> I don't know. What you do. Okay. So, so that's the impact, and uh, just on the numbers of what would happen if we were pushed down to the uh, 
8.4%. Um, and that 6.2 billion is, 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 is what we talked about at the beginning, the 1,200 pounds per person. Um, so 1,200 times 5.3 5 million is 6.2 billion. Okay. A wee quote from what happened the last time. Um, Scotland actually voted uh, voted yes, obviously, but the 40% rule prevented it being enacted. Um, there's a wee quote, if everybody can, can see the quote. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's real. I mean, that's from Daily Express, February 1979, trying to scare people into voting no. Okay. And there's a, a wee quote. I'm not going to say this because... Um, there's a film of George Bush trying to say it and making a complete mess of it. So, so you can just read it. <laughs> okay. 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 I want to just throw something up now before I finish, which is um, people talk about, I, I was at a presentation today and somebody was talking about what it would look like after yes in terms of the cooperation between the UK uh, and an independent Scotland. Uh, and all the kind of stuff that gets talked about at the moment is all politic and etc. And the reality is that after a yes vote, the rest of the UK and Scotland will work very, very close together. Um, so if you can read read through that, um, it's an actual quote, and I'll show you in a minute where it's from. Okay. Everybody been uh, been through it. Okay. So it's an actual quote from last year. Okay. It could well apply to Scotland's future. Okay, in relationship with the UK. That's actually uh, David Cameron and Edna Kenny. Okay. Um, so you think about the history between the UK and Ireland um, and everything that's happened there over the last decades um, and that they're able to uh, to cooperate to that level um, and drive towards more cooperation, then absolutely no doubt that um, an independent Scotland with control of its own finances and its own policies and uh, its own making its own way in the world would have a very cooperative relationship in reality with uh, the rest of the UK. Okay, um, that's me. Thanks very much. And I'll pass over to Alan to uh, take the next part. <laughs>